And joining us now to discuss the 2024 campaigns and also a lot more, former Speaker of the House, Democratic Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi of California. Madam Speaker, thanks so much for your time this morning. We, we have a lot to get to. And I want to start with the, the 2024 landscape. You have been at the center of Democratic messaging and strategy uh, for so many years. And I'm interested. You made the point to my colleague Dana Bash a couple weeks ago. That this is the moment where the president and his team need to get out more. They have a message. Uh, they have a resume. They need to start talking about it more. He's going to be in Pennsylvania today. Have you seen a shift in the message that you think is effective over the course of the last couple of weeks? Yes. Well, now we are in the election year and uh, the president has been wor working very hard over the past three years to do what is necessary to meet the needs of the American people. Now he can go talk about it. And he has a lot to say. Uh, the kitchen table needs are what are the most important uh, to families, but also make the biggest difference in elections. He, but look at the votes. Look at the, the job numbers. Uh, over 14 million jobs created while he was president. Set uh, unemployment reduced, uh, inflation on the downturn. And I'm very proud of what's happening with health care. He has, he has worked to reduce the cost of health care, whether th through the Affordable Care Act or the cost of prescription drugs. People have to know because their kitchen table needs are what are important to them. And the democracy message relates to the kitchen table. Democracy is a personal issue. Freedom of choice to have when and if you have a family. Uh, freedom to, uh, to enjoy your work, have, knowing you have a pension so that your family will be secure. The education of your children, the safety of the environment in which they live. He scores very high on all of those points. And many people are appreciating and enjoying it. They just are not giving him credit for it. And this is uh, what we have to do now is to make sure that not only the president, but other validators come forward uh, to, to uh, say what he's done. But what's really important to people is what he is going to do. Nobody votes for you for what you've done. Right. They want to know what comes next. Can you, when you say other validators, what do you, what do you mean by that? Because there's been some criticism that there aren't enough surrogates out there. There aren't enough people within specific constituencies in the Democratic coalition or just generally uh, that are getting the message out in an effective way. Well, they will. I, I don't I don't find that to be a problem. Uh, they will. The, uh, governors, elected officials, yes, but also community activists as well. Uh, for example, uh, you give me the opportunity to talk about our outside mobilization. This is neighbor to neighbor. Uh, we have um, in, in 2018, you may recall, uh, people said, weren't you lucky that health care became the issue in the campaign? I said, no, we weren't lucky. We made our own luck. We had 10,000 events where people told their stories about what the Affordable Care Act meant to them. Now you have the former president saying Obamacare sucks. No, it doesn't suck. It cures. Affordable Care Act cures. And as you see, record number 20 million signed up, and we should still have a couple more days to go with that. Right. But it won't be. Uh, the surrogates are the people telling their stories across the country. And that mobilization to own the ground, to get out the vote, uh, to win the election for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the United States Senate, and the House of Representatives. It, it's, criti it's critical every cycle, no question about that. And you guys have certainly demonstrated success on it uh, when you won back the House and when President Biden won in 2020. I think the question, though, you, you raise a lot of things that I think drive some of the frustration. If you look at the legislative record that you were detailing that the president had in the first two years, and the way that on individual basis, every single piece that you laid out there pulls quite well. You lay out what the former president has said he wants to do in terms of repealing Obamacare, in terms of being proud of Roe versus Wade being struck down, uh, in terms of more tax cuts uh, al along the lines of what you saw in 2017. Mm -hmm. That also polls much better for Democrats than it would for him. And yet, this is a neck and neck race and no one feels very comfortable on the Democratic side of things that Donald Trump isn't going to be the next president. Well, I don't think that nobody feels. I think many of us know that it is impossible uh, for him to be the president again well, with what he is that? proposing. 
Well, because when you're talking about what he's talking about now is more tax cuts for corporate America, taking them down so low to the detriment uh, uh, of our budget and meeting the needs of people. But people have to know. I have said over and over again, President Lincoln said public sentiment is everything. Right. With it, you can accomplish almost anything without it. Practically nothing. But public sentiment has to be informed. People have to know. So we can talk more about what he has done, what it means at the kitchen table for people to have lower costs for prescription drugs, lower costs for health care, because it's not just about their good health. It's about their financial health and security as well. And instead of just talking about why aren't they doing more, we are and we will. And again, the outside, our inside maneuvering to get the job done, the president's vision for our country, his knowledge of the issues, his strategic thinking as a legislator are so important, but so is his emotional uh, connection, the empathy he has for working families in our country. He springs from that background and he understands it and he cares, he cares about it. So that's what that you will see. Yeah. And uh, again, the president and millions of people mobilizing outside uh, to get the message out, neighbor to neighbor, friend to friend, right. person to person. Do you wish he was, you know, you make the point about kind of who he is or how Democrats see him and why he's been effective as a politician, uh, particularly within the party over the course of five decades now. Do you wish he was not, I don't mean out giving campaign speeches more, I just mean out more, talking to, talking in interviews, talking on the ground, doing rope lines. We just haven't seen as much of that. Well, you know what? The president has the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's the president of the United States, a very challenging job. There are only so many hours in the day. Uh, and I trust his judgment that when now people are starting to pay attention you know, it, again, you can be saying things, and people are busy living their lives, raising their families, doing their jobs. It's a tough time. So you want to spend the time talking to them when they're ready to listen. And in the, now that the campaign year has started, and you, you talked about the weather in Iowa for next week, I'm, I'm, I'm so sad for the voters there, even though it's just largely a a Republican caucus that they have the opportunity uh, to cast their votes uh, in a safe way, uh, uh, health-wise, too, as it's right. so cold, but also the danger of snow. But it is, um, it is an election time is, is, it, it has vitality about it. It's exciting, and we respect people's views, respect their concerns. But I've always said, you can tell them everything you've done. But nobody gets elected because they deserve it. They get elected because of what they're going to do next. And what he is going to do next is, again, to continue the work he's done for America's working families, whether it's a child tax credit, right. continuing to save Affordable Care Act, save the reduction in prescription drugs, uh, and continue to grow the economy. But again, in a way that is, uh, gives confidence to people that they and their families have a role to play. People are concerned about uh, uh, innovation and how it affects them, globalization, right. how it affects them, immigration, how it affects them. And we want them to know that in all of his policies, it's about making sure that people have the opportunity, whether it's through education or job, job creation and the rest, that has the beautiful diversity of America, but also, but also includes everyone. Right. In our no, it'll, it'll certainly be a, a central piece of what he lays out in the weeks ahead, including heading towards the State of the Union. Uh, former Speaker Pelosi, stay with yeah. us. Well, I also want to talk a lot about Capitol Hill. We have a lot more to discuss there. We'll be back to you in a moment, mm -hmm. including... Uh, a group of hard-right Republicans now threatening to derail a deal to avoid a possible government shutdown in just a matter of days. We're going to ask former Speaker how this could imperil the current Speaker's agenda just a couple months into his tenure. That's not what we want to see out of our speaker. Um, otherwise, what's the difference in, you know, you know, Nancy Pelosi having the gavel and us having the majority? I didn't come up here to spend more money than Nancy Pelosi as a Republican, and I'm not going to be a part of it. Hardline conservative lawmakers invoking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to ramp up their pressure against current House Speaker Mike Johnson. They are threatening to derail bipartisan negotiations. Just negotiations, a deal.
that Johnson struck with Democrats and Senate Republicans to keep the government open. Back with us, the aforementioned former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Mm. But what, what do you think when you hear that you are still very much in the minds of the rank and file mm. Republicans in the House? Well, I haven't paid too much attention to what they're saying. But what I do know after 20 years uh, as either leader or speaker, uh, that when you're dealing on, with the budget bill, it's a negotiation. Nobody ever gets everything that they want. Uh, but you have to pass it because you cannot shut down government. And so uh, w when a few people decide that they have an objection and they want to hold up the works, that's that's a disservice to their leader, to their speaker. They have won the majority. They have a major responsibility. But they, we also have a president of the United States who will sign the bill, a majority in right. the United Senate that has to pass it. So there has to be uh, a negotiation and a compromise. And uh, it, it's hard. It's not an easy thing. It's hard, but you have to get it done. Yeah, there's, there's no question, I think, very much harder now to some degree, uh, which has something to do on some level with the leadership. Do you have advice uh, to give the current Speaker of the House? Well, uh, respect. Respect is a word that I always use for my own members along the way. Uh, it, there are different, uh, shall we say, uh, equities to be weighed when you're doing a, a budget. But there are different bills in the course of a year, and they'll prevail on some and won't prevail on others. Uh, but as long as they know that their views are recognized, they should be able to come to the table. But this is, well, we're di there's a difference between Democrats and Republicans in this regard. We believe in governance, and we want to get the job done. All the shutdowns of government have come under Republican uh, leadership, whether it was starting with Newt Gingrich in the 90s and then under the Republicans when President Obama was president, but the Republicans shut government down, and then uh, under uh, President uh, Trump uh, when he took pride in shutting down government. Because they don't believe in governance. So not having a budget shutting down government is a, is a plus for them. That's what they like. They don't like governance. They don't also like science. So if science says we have to have certain protections for our climate, for our people, for the this, for the that, and government has some protections to offer, those two no's do not make a yes. There, there's so no question that there are, there are sharp ideological differences between the two parties. Uh, certainly seem to be exacerbated now. I, I do want to ask, though, because the, the current speaker did put out a statement of support for President Biden's uh, order to have the coalition strike in Yemen. You were talking about the weight of the world that's on the president's shoulder. That is certainly yes. the case right now. Do you support this decision? There have been some in your caucus uh, or in the Democratic caucus that have raised concerns that this is not within the presidential authority. This, you know, there are a few, but it is within the president's authority. Uh, this is they were ma making strikes on ships that affect commerce and the rest. Uh, it's a multilateral uh, decision to go forward. It was not a declaration of war that has to come from Congress. Uh, I respect those who have their view, but I don't agree with them. And I, I think the president made the right decision. Are you concerned more broadly, um, given the conflict in the Middle East and the president's efforts to try and navigate that? Mm -hmm. Uh, how your party will react going forward. As in, you, you talk to people like Debbie Dingell in Michigan, re very real concerns about how voters, Democratic-based voters there, are going to react uh, throughout the country as well, young voters in particular. Well, the president of the United States, our president, has acted with great uh, values-based uh, principles to what is happening there. Uh, it, he, what happened on October 7th was horrible. The hostages are still not freed. But we don't like e uh, the uh, aerial bombing of civilians in Gaza to the extent that that has happened. So there has to be a path out of that. The two-state solution is one that the president has supported, that many of us have supported with him for a very long time. And I think that uh, uh, what the president is trying to do for humanitarian assistance over $10 billion uh, into Gaza has not been taken up by the Republicans. So when people say, well, these people need help and the rest, and the president should make it happen, well, it is an expenditure, a, 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 a fiscal bill that has right. to come uh, from the Congress of the United States. So I think that when when the election, ha as we 
go through this. And it's a terrible situation. It's, it's heartbreaking in every way, whether it's about the, the do you have concerns assault or the consequences of that. Certainly. Do you have concerns? So much of how the president has operated here has been trying to uh, work behind the scenes, as he's always done uh, on foreign policy related issues with Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. Do you have concerns about Netanyahu's leadership, the, the, how his government operates right now on the path forward? Yeah, well, I've never been a, a particular fan of Netanyahu. Uh, he hasn't been a particular fan of the two-state solution, which is an answer uh, to so much of this. Again, I come back to the word uh, respect. But uh, our president has great uh, foreign policy experience as a former chair of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, as a vice president of the United States, and now as president. So I respect his judgment and uh, feel sad that the turn of events has caused so much heartbreak uh, for the people of Gaza, and that's really at the doorstep of Netanyahu. Former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, we always appreciate your time uh, and thoughts and expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Nice to be with you.